Throughout much of the 20th century, the United States military depended on the dangerous radioactive element radium to illuminate countless gauges and dials in its planes and ships. Radium was discovered by Marie and Pierre Curie in 1898. The strange new element glowed an eerie blue-green color, which Marie Curie fancied. She carried test tubes of the stuff around in her pocket. She didn't know that radium is extremely dangerous. Curie conducted much of her work in a shed, without safety precautions. In 1934, Marie Curie died of aplastic anemia, almost certainly a victim of radiation poisoning. The public, too, went radium mad. Radium found its way into makeup, water, even sheet music. The dials of watches and gauges soon were painted with radium, all the better to see in the dark. Much of what we now know about the dangers of radium came from these women. They're called the Radium Girls. Working for the U.S. Radium Corporation in New Jersey in the 1920s and other companies, they painted dials with the glow-in-the-dark paint. They would lick their paintbrushes to get a sharp point. Within a few years, many of the Radium Girls began getting terrible cancers in their mouths and gums. After the Radium Girls, few had any doubt that radium could be dangerous. But the U.S. military, into the 1970s, continued to use radium-coated equipment, even though the Pentagon knew that radium was dangerous and could cause cancer. The military depended on an unknown number of contractors, like Carnish Instruments in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, to manufacture and repair its stock of radium instruments. The Pentagon's radium contractor in Lock Haven, Lou Carnish, was not the most reliable of men. One day in 1980, Lou Carnish told his wife he was going downstairs to clean a picture frame. He had other ideas. He doused himself with gasoline. He set himself on fire. Lou Carnish died a few days later in the hospital with burns over most of his body. In 2007, more than a quarter century after Carnish's death, across town from the house where he set himself on fire, alarming levels of radiation were found in a building he once owned. By that time, college students would be living in the building. Almost a year after the problem was discovered, the students were quietly told to move out. To remove the nuclear contamination, environmental officials quietly raised the building and excavated deep into the ground to dig out the poison. This is what was left. But what caused this crater? And why had Luke Carnish burned himself to death? So, uh, you know, I wake up like a normal day, I go outside, I see them doing the, uh, the testing, they're walking around their moon suits, they're walking around my car, they're walking around the building. But I had gotten a phone call from my son Tyler saying that there were uh, men out in his yard in spacesuits. And I said, well, go out and ask them what they're doing there. An average person, an average university wouldn't imagine that that there are rental places that have been contaminated by Pentagon radioactivity. Not in, in your what? Not in your wildest dreams. I mean, this is this is like what? You know, when I first heard this, I went, "What? What are you telling me?" I, I kept saying, "Wait, wait, tell me this again." I understand that a lot of it was military contracts. Whenever we got a big contract from the government, you know, from the military, then one of the fellows would say, "Well, we'll be working some more. We got a big." Big order. Did anybody ever tell you that that was radioactive? No. Did they ever tell you the solvent was radioactive? No, no, no. Because we didn't know that it was going to hurt us. The U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, the government agency at the time in charge of licensing, sometime in the 1950s or 60s, gave Lou Carnish permission to dump radioactive waste on his grounds. 
Other companies had been given similar permission by the U.S. government to follow the environment with long-lived poisons. The big bucket we took outside. That's where I dumped it. I only know what I dumped. But n nobody ever told you that this was radioactive or no. Would be dangerous? No, but that's where I was told to dump it. Environmental officials had to dig a 12-foot crater at the same spot to rid the property of the worst contamination. These high concentrations of radium contamination were a risk not only to the workers of Carnish Instruments in the 1950s and 60s. Today, the runoff from the ignored radium contamination threatens neighboring properties, including an elderly care facility next door. Wait a minute. Explain this to me again. You're telling me that somebody who was painting airplane parts that had contamination and this apartment was put there? made into apartments and I'm like what you know it's like you must have read in the newspaper that they had students living up there in the second floor no I didn't know that I didn't know that until you just told me but you seem so, sort of upset about it I don't know wonder how many children how many of them boys and girls lived there well if this was one of your kids you know that was living in the rental place, would you be worried about their health? I most certainly would, and I'd be doing something about it. I'd be going after somebody. My son's a health and phys ed major at Lock Haven in his fifth year, and he plans to be a health and phys ed teacher and a coach. The longer you are exposed to radiation, the more it hurts you. Why then were the students and their families kept in the dark for months, even years, by state environmental officials? What were these officials thinking? Internal documents from the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection shed light on what decisions were made, when they were made, and why they were made. On December 28, 2007, a State Department of Environmental Protection employee noted preliminary high readings. The most disturbing fact, the email notes, is that the levels seemed to be higher in the apartments where the students lived. Another manager advised proceeding quietly and not creating a, quote, public issue over the situation. On January 2, 2008, George Hartenstein of the state's Bureau of Waste Management noted in an email that upstairs are apartments that house college students. If we get into a public issue with closing down the business and requiring the relocation of the students, he cautions, this may cause some community concern. The email continues, we may even need to refer to the Department of Health for a health assessment. And so state environmental officials worried they had a health problem on their hands with the students, but also worried about the public relations fallout if this became known. Do you think this is how students should be, students who are going to school should be treated? No. Do you think this is how young people in the United States of America should be treated? I don't think anybody and anywhere should be treated like this. How, how do you feel when I give you this report that's marked not for public release? How do I feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> Angry? Um, lied to? No, what if I were to tell you that the Pentagon has an inventory list of every place they put these gauges and dials? What would you say about that? I would say that they were negligent. If there's a contaminant out there, it's like anything else. If it was passed around, I mean, even if you go to a restaurant and you eat tomatoes that have E. coli in, they have to track it to see where it came from. And then they have to stop everybody from eating it. 